so what we're going to do in chapter eight is we're going to start relaxing those assumptions. We're going to relax the assumptions of perfect competition, and then we're going to see what does that do to the market. So it's really what we're doing is we're kind of starting with the extreme of competition, and then now we're going to do at the beginning of chapter eight is we're going to say what happens if you take competition away. And then what this does is it creates a continuum that we can analyze competitive forces. And this is really important. Um, understanding how markets work in the context of their competitive forces is an extremely important conversation as it pertains to policy issues, as it pertains to the efficiency and health of an economic system. Um, and so that, that will we'll certainly show this. Um, so here's just some, some good quotes, I think. Um, Darren uh, Esimoglou uh, is one of the more prominent uh, economists of the last uh, probably 30 years. He's done a lot of work in sort of looking at what happens to markets when firms have market power, like widespread monopoly power. And what he has shown in his research is how, um, you know, to some extent, these markets uh, are, are a bit destructive, that there are... Um, cost to society of allowing businesses to amass lots and lots of market power. Um, and so that's going to be a little bit of the focus of what we're talking in today. You know, if we're going to have a, a capitalist system, if we're going to have a market-based economic system, we want that system to be as competitive as possible. Because more competitive means more economically efficient. It means the economy is working more efficiently. If you have an economic system where you have a lot of uh, some, uh, large firms with a lot of market power, this reduces the overall efficiency of your economic system for the most part, and therefore your economic system will not work as well over the long run. And we're, we're sort of dealing with that right now in the U.S. The U.S. is dealing with a level of market concentration. When I say market concentration, what I mean is if you look at an individual industry like telecommunications or computer technology, and you look at how much market power the firms have at or near the top, you see extreme amounts of market concentration. You know, if you look at like you know, Google, for example, is a really good example of, of a firm which has an extreme amount of market uh, market power and, and exists in an industry that is not readily, could not readily be described as competitive whatsoever. And one thing I want to sort of point out is that sometimes students get they, the presence of other firms in a market does not mean a market is, co is competitive, okay? So sometimes firms will look at, like, say, telecommunications, where you have AT&T and um, uh, Verizon, and they'll say, well, AT&T and Verizon are competing with each other, so that must be a competitive market. No, no, no. It's really important that when we think about competitive markets, we're thinking about many firms, not just two or three. And that's actually one of the, the types of markets we'll, we'll discuss at the very end of class today is like what happens in a market when we only have a couple or a few firms. Um, this is a good quote from a great movie, There Will Be Blood. Um, I have competition in me. I want no one else to succeed. And I think that this, to me, this, this quote really encapsulates the paradox of competition. So if you're a very competitive person and you want to be in business, the truth is, is that you don't actually want to exist in a competitive business. Like you want to be a monopolist because as a competitive person, you want to be the best, right? And, you know, listen, if your business does well and you provide jobs, that's great. But to a certain extent, as we'll discuss in this particular chapter, there are inefficiencies uh, to market power. There are, are social losses um, to market power. No, telecommunications would not, not, not even close to being competitive. No, Lord, no. You get to pick what kind of cable that you uh, have when you move into a new apartment. Uh, extremely high. Extremely high. Yeah, barriers to entry are huge. Like when you move into an apartment in New York City, you're told what cable package you can get. <laughs> it's like insane. That's how much market power exists. You don't even get a choice, right? I mean, you could choose not to have it, I guess. Absolutely. Okay, so I like to think about market power like gravity. You know, one of the things about gravity, the best way to understand gravity is just to understand that the larger, the more mass um, that an object has, the more gravity, the more relative gravity it will have, right? So why does the earth 
revolve around the sun it's because the sun is substantially larger than the earth and the earth is inside of its you know the field of influence that causes the earth to be somewhat stationary um, to the sun now why is the earth stationary Right. Well, it's because there's planets, you know, on the other side of us, very large planets such as Jupiter, which are helping to keep us sort of in place, right? Because we're being kind of pulled towards Jupiter, uh, we're being pulled a little bit towards the, the sun. And so, you know, again, this is sort of one of the more remarkable aspects of, of where Earth is in the context of our solar system. You know, they refer to it as the Goldilocks zone, um, where, you know, all of the sort of conditions are, are you know, a perfect for you know having like stable life systems and things like that but we can think about gravity as being a force that sort of pulls things towards it and 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 more importantly uh gravity is a force that warps uh, gravity warps things it warps uh you know the behavior of other objects it, it warps time in fact it's so powerful that it in fact can warp time and so a good way to think about uh, market power is that it's like gravity. It it will warp markets. It will. So if we think about, you know, if, if a market had a competition, it would behave a particular way. If that market loses competition, it gets warped around that market power. It, it becomes defined by, um, in fact, that market power. So again, this is what we're doing here. We're, we're, we're sort of considering this continuum, perfect competition here to the right, monopoly. Uh, monopsony um, is a, a market structure in which there's only one buyer of a good. Um, so monopoly is only one seller and monopsony is only one buyer. We don't really talk much about monopsonies. Um, a good example of a monopsony is like if you have a, a large business located in like a small rural town and they're like, it's like the only place you can get a job. That's sort of like a monopsony. The, the, the firm becomes the only demander of labor in that area, era, area. And as a result, people getting jobs at that particular business don't have much bargaining power, right? So that's, that's, that's a, an example of a monopsony. Um, you know, another good example of a monopsony is like, sometimes the way Walmart works is that Walmart buys products from local farmers. And if Walmart comes into town and causes other smaller grocery stores to go out of business, it becomes the sort of fact that Walmart becomes a monopsony for those local farmers. And so as a result, those local farmers can sometimes suffer because, you know, Walmart is going to kind of squeeze them a little bit because they are able to do that. They have market power. Um, so there's been all sorts of problems. Walmart's a lot better now than they used to be. But back in the late 90s, Walmart was really bad about squeezing their farmers. And uh, it wasn't until people sort of were made aware of it that there was actually sort of a concerted effort <clears throat> for Walmart to, uh, to do better. So they, they have done better since then. Um, but we're going to focus mainly on monopolies. Uh, monopoly just means there's one seller um, in a market. All right. So um, what reduces market power, sorry, what reduces competition in a market? Um, a lot of things. Here are five examples. Um, when I say resource procurement, I mean that the production of your, your product requires a very, very expensive resource. Um, requires, you know, this is true for a lot of things. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, let's say, um, building automobiles, um, resource procurement is going to be an extremely high cost. It's not cheap to obtain the materials that enable you to make automobiles, right? So a huge barrier to entry in the automobile industry is just the extreme high fixed cost of procuring the resources that enable you to put a car together. Right. Um, you know, you could you, you could start up a bakery. Um, bakeries have fixed costs. You got to buy the, you know, the machines and you got to buy the storefront. But those fixed costs are much smaller compared to the fixed costs that would be associated with buying a, an automotive factory, uh, for example. Um, political lobbying um, causes uh, uh, competitive forces to decline. Sometimes businesses spend a lot of money to get um, laws that are favorable to them that, that create barriers to entry. So sometimes the government creates barriers to entry, um, in, a, in, a, in a fairly negative way. We'll actually talk about um, an example of a, a, what we call a regulated monopoly um, and why that can actually be, be useful to society. We'll sort of distinguish between 
two types of monopolies here in just a moment. Um, brand loyalty, sometimes firms generate market power because their products are what people like. Um, Apple products, you know, Apple computers is a great example of this. They have a lot of, um, they have a lot of market power and a lot of that market power comes from, um, Sorry, somebody, uh, somebody is they're, they're like noises are coming through and it's distracting me. So if you're, if you're <laughs> maybe if you think it's maybe you maybe mute yourself because it's just for some reason it's extremely distracting to me. Um, okay, so, uh, so brand loyalty is a big, big example of this. Even going back to let's go back to that pizza example like New York pizza places. So yeah, there's a lot of competition, but we know that there are certain pizza places that are known for being like the best. Right. I live a few blocks from Defara Pizza here in Midwood. Um, Defara is sometimes considered the best pizza place in New York City. And they, not only are they very popular, um, people, people you know, choose to eat there as opposed to pizza places that are closer to them, their prices are actually a little bit higher. So a slice of pizza there is like five bucks, right? Which first time I saw it, I couldn't believe it. Because normally I'm eating Pronto Pizza there uh, in the financial district, um, you know, a slice there is $2 to 250 what you would normally expect. But because Defara has market power, they have this brand loyalty, it enables them to charge a higher price. So it's a great example of, of being able to look at a market and, and knowing that the market itself is fairly competitive, but because this firm has brand loyalty, that helps to explain why Defara sells pizza so expensive, right? For each slice is so expensive. Um, innovation can sometimes lead to market power. So I don't want you to get in your idea in your heads that market power is always derived from like nefarious. Sometimes society benefits from the innovations that then lead to market power. Um, good example of this is like smartphone technology. So smartphone technology has equipped uh, Apple computers and, and other companies with an extreme amount of market power because it's very profitable to sell smartphones, but we have benefited from smartphones, right? I mean, there's some, maybe some questions about the extent to which we've benefited from them, but, but you know, society benefits sometimes from the things that create market power. So while we may criticize market power as a, as a, as a problem, and again, we're going to show that here in a few moments, the, it is true sometimes that market power is derived from things that we still benefit from. And we should recognize that. Again, we benefit from business innovation, but sometimes that innovation leads to market power, which in the long run actually causes some, some social issues. And then even something like a spatial advantage. When I say spatial advantage, I mean like if you're the only gas station within a hundred miles, right? You're gonna have market power. Like if you ever go to like a, a mountain town, their gas prices are always more expensive. Why are they more expensive? There's fewer gas stations in mountain towns. It costs more money to get the gasoline to the gas station in the mountain town. As a result, the firm has a little bit of market power and that's why the prices of gasoline are more expensive in those mountain towns, right? So when you, you see those price differentials across the same types of firms, usually you can chalk up those price differentials to being some form of market power. Something about that firm, either some internal attribute or some external attribute is giving that firm a little bit of market power and this enables them to, uh, to charge slightly higher prices or considerably higher prices. Um, or of course, we're gonna go to the extreme and we're gonna say, well, what actually happens in a market when there's only one firm? Like there's only one firm in a market, what, is that, what does that mean? Okay, so what we're concerned about is this concept called rent extraction. Um, rent extraction is something that does not happen in competitive markets. Um, and what rent extraction is, is the ability of a firm to extract from consumers um, what used to be consumer surplus, but they extract it in the form of profits, okay? So when going back to our example of Apple computers, Apple computers uses their brand loyalty to charge their consumers more uh, for their product. So again, think about marginal cost pricing. So Apple computers has a marginal cost to produce a laptop. Um, they are able to charge a price which is far beyond that marginal cost. And at least part of the reason why they're able to charge a lot beyond that marginal cost is because of brand loyalty. So the brand loyalty gives Apple computers market power. And by market power here, we mean they're able to set their own price. And when they set that price, they set it in order to maximize profits. 
And this is why Apple products are so much more expensive than other products, right? My wife, um, you know, she bought a lot, she's a journalist. So she, you know, bought a laptop a few years ago. It was like almost $2,000. Um, I bought a laptop, you know, a few months later and it was, you know, a quarter of that basically. Now we need different types of computers ultimately, but it was, it was, you know, almost astonishing to me how much different the prices was between the two computers. Well, to an economist, an economist looks at that situation and says, well, okay, you got your, your expensive laptop. That's great. But you probably also had rent extracted from you, meaning that you paid a price that was so high that your consumer surplus is, is now lower than really in some sense what it should have been. So this is what we mean by rent extraction. It means that businesses use their market power to take consumer surplus from you, take additional consumer surplus from you. So that's a lot of what we're going to discuss um, in chapter eight is this idea of rent extraction. And we're going to show how rent extraction exists in, in the context of a monopoly. And then we're going to show how firms use various techniques to extract economic rents as well. But just to go ahead and define economic rents, what we mean is that these are profits that a firm earns, not by virtue of selling their product, but by virtue of having market power, right? By virtue of having market power. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare the monopolist outcome to the perfectly competitive outcome. And we're going to show how much the monopolist is able to upcharge their products because they have market power. And we'll distinguish between the, the perfectly competitive outcome and the monopolist outcome. And you'll see why the monopolist outcome is considered socially inefficient. We, in fact, refer to a monopolist market as a market failure. Um, and when we say market failure, what we mean is that the market does not produce economic efficiency. So if, you know, up to this point, we have described competitive markets. And, and when we have competitive markets, those markets are economically efficient when we let them do what they're going to do. In markets with market power, with monopoly power, those markets are not efficient. And so if we just let those markets do what they want to do, they actually reduce economic efficiency, which we refer to as a market failure. It means the market fails to maximize economic efficiency. And that's extremely problematic, right? We don't want that. Even though we may believe that businesses should have the freedom to do as they please, at the same time, we want to make sure that our economic system is working for, you know, the whole system and is working economically efficiently. Okay, so um, last chapter we talked about um, the individual demand curve that perfect competitors face. So if we look over here to the left, we said that perfect competitors face horizontal demand curves, what we call perfectly elastic demand curves. This just means that they charge whatever the market price is being set. So whatever the, the market price is, this asserts their demand curve, their marginal revenue curve, uh, to put it another way. And so, um, and, and really what the, the horizontal nature of the demand curve means is that the firm will charge this price, whatever this price is. They're not gonna charge more than this. They're not gonna charge less than this. They will charge this price, right? There's no demand above, no demand below. They will charge this particular price, okay? So when, this sort of highlights the fact that the firm doesn't have the ability um, to, to set their own prices. Um, and just to kind of, again, take you back to how we showed this in, um, perfect competition in, in chapter seven, right? The market sets a price, right? Here's the price being set. And then wherever that market price is set, you know, that's that firm's mar uh, marginal revenue as well. And this of course defines the profit maximizing decision of the perfect competitor and ultimately goes on to define their profits, right? So market sets a price, the firm doesn't set a price. The firm <clears throat> is, is uh, picks the price that the, um, that the firm sets and that's what they charge. Uh, in the monopoly outcome, this is not the case. First off, uh, since the monopolist is the only firm in the market, the only uh, business in town, so to speak, um, they see the entire demand curve. So in perfect competition, there's so many sellers in the market and so many buyers in the market that individual sellers only see small slivers of the demand curve, which is another reason why they're horizontal. Under a monopolist, because the monopolist is, is the only firm in the market, they see the entire demand curve. So the demand curve is normal downward sloping as we would expect to see it. Again, because there's a single firm in the market, so they see the entire demand curve. What this means is that marginal revenue is therefore distinct from the demand curve. In the perfect competition example, the demand curve was equal to marginal revenue. 
was just equal to the market price. But for the monopolist, the marginal revenue curve is, is different, is distinct. And the easiest way to think about the marginal revenue curve for a monopolist is it's just the demand curve with twice the slope. Like that's it. It's the demand curve with twice the slope. Um, I actually have a, a, a TikTok video that I made that um, <clears throat> takes you through the steps of, of how to see this mathematically, although it's not super important. Um, if, you know, check out that video if you're curious as to why the marginal revenue curve is downward sloping, or I'm sorry, is, is, has twice the slope of the demand curve. Uh, actually, what it is is that if you just go through and you calculate marginal revenue as you move down the demand curve, it creates a line which is the demand curve with twice the slope. So it's more of like a mathematical principle than anything else. But to see this, you know, here's a demand curve, just a general demand curve, A minus BQ, and then the marginal revenue curve would be A minus 2BQ, right? Just double the slope. So, so you know, whether how you want to learn this is up to you. I think graphically is just fine, but just kind of get into your head that the marginal revenue curve of a monopolist is the demand curve with twice the slope. Right, that's all it is. Everything else is the same. Start from the same place. Um, it's just the demand curve with twice the slope. Um, this is really important and ultimately is one of the reasons why the monopolist uh, charges prices above their marginal cost. Okay, so let's start by first looking at an efficient outcome. So the efficient outcome, as we already have, have talked about, occurs at the intersection of the supply curve and the demand curve. Um, notice that the, the supply cur curve here is labeled as marginal cost of the monopolist. Um, remember that the supply curve in a market is essentially the marginal cost curve of that market. And so here what we're saying is, okay, we're gonna be describing a monopolist. Let's think about what this market would look like if instead of having a monopolist, we had a normal competitive market, okay? And so this means that equilibrium would exist at the intersection of, of the supply curve, which is the marginal cost curve, and the demand curve. And so this is the competitive outcome. This is the perfectly competitive outcome of supply equals demand. So earlier in the semester, when we talked about supply and demand, right, when you see this set up here with supply and demand, the, the assumption is, is that this is a perfectly competitive market, okay? So now what we're doing is we're going to take markets and we're going to we're going to compare them to what happens when um, there is not perfect competition. So uh, notice that consumer surplus and producer surplus are maximized as we've already we already learned. The first fundamental welfare theorem of economics says that competitive markets maximize economic efficiency. So this competitive outcome is efficient. Uh, we know it's efficient because there's no dead weight loss. Right? Just like we saw previously with whenever a market is in equilibrium, there's no dead weight loss. Importantly, also, there's no rent extracted. Okay, There's no rent extracted in the situation either. And so there's no dead weight loss and no rent extracted. So this is, this is what this market would look like if it were competitive. Okay, This is what this market would look like. It would charge a price of $5 and it would sell 100 units of the product. Keep that in mind, right? Pay attention to the market price, pay attention to the market quantity. Those are gonna be very important. So again, this is what happens under a competitive market, which is economically efficient. Now, okay, now there's a lot going on here. So don't, don't, don't lose, lose me just yet, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, let's, let's show what happens under the monopolies, okay? So we know that firms maximize profits where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? So this means that the monopolist will choose their profit maximizing quantity at the intersection of their marginal cost curve and their marginal revenue curve. Okay, remember in this graph, this is just a supply curve. So we're just equating supply and demand and that gives us a competitive equilibrium, right? Here, this is the marginal cost for the monopolist this is the marginal revenue for the monopolist. Remember, firms always maximize profits by setting marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, okay? What you should notice immediately is that the profit maximizing quantity for the monopolist, 33.33, is considerably lower than the profit maximizing quantity for a perfect competitor, okay? Or for perfect competition. So in other words, when a perfectly competitive market uh, 
uh, equilibrates, it's going to produce a consumption and production of 50 units, and obviously supply equals demand at the competitive equilibrium. Whereas under the monopolist, the profit maximizing condition produces an, a quantity of 33.33. So right off the bat, we see that under a monopolist, the amount of product brought to the market is going to be lower than it was under a competitive market. So we can already see that right out from the, from the jump. So when a monopolist maximizes profits, they set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, and this produces a quantity outcome, which is lower than under perfect competition. So right from the, from the start, we can see that under a monopolist, the market is going to see less product. The market is going to see less than it would have seen under perfect competition. So it already gives you a hint that we are starting to be inefficient, right? Under a competitive market, we get 50 units. Under the monopolist, we only get 33 units, okay? Now, the other important point, and perhaps the most important point, is that the monopolist is able to pick the price they sell their product for. If we are thinking that this is the competitive equilibrium, we know that firms in a, per, in a perfectly competitive market would all just charge $5. And so they would charge $5 for the product and consumers would get access to 100 units of which they would purchase 100 units because supply equals demand, right? Again, this is the competitive equilibrium. For the monopolist, they set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost which establishes their profit maximizing quantity. Then the monopolists ask themselves, how much am I able to charge for this profit maximizing quantity that maximizes my profits? Now, in order to answer this question, we just have to remember that the demand curve represents maximum willingness to pay. So the demand curve actually tells us how much people will be willing to pay for a given quantity level. So what the monopolist does is they take their quantity and they go up to the demand curve and they see that on the demand curve, the willingness to pay for 33 units is about $6.67. Notice that this is higher than the price that would be charged in a competitive market. So not only does the monopolist market produce a smaller quantity than the perfectly competitive market, but it also charges a higher price than the perfectly competitive market. And, and again, all you need to, to remember with this is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Again, I told you how important that was. It's all you have to remember, right? So if the monopolist sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, this produces a monopolist quantity of 33.33, and it produces a monopoly price of $6.67, okay? This difference between $5 and $6.67 is known as the monopolist markup. It is the pri higher price that you pay because this is a monopoly market as opposed to a competitive market, okay? <clears throat> so under the com competitive market, you would pay $5. Under the monopolist, you would pay $1.67 more. That $1.67 is, is known as the markup, okay? Now, <clears throat> more important than all this, if we go back to the competitive outcome, one of the things we notice is that at equilibrium, the price for the good is equal to marginal cost, right? So when a firm produces 100 units, their marginal cost is $5 and the price they're selling their good for is also $5, right? So again, we have that marginal cost pricing outcome that we just talked about for chapter seven. With the monopolist though, you'll see that at 33.33 units of the product, their marginal cost is only $3.33. Right, it takes it straight up to the marginal cost curve. We can see that the marginal cost of 33 units is about $3, while the firm is charging $6.67 for the product. Notice that the price they're charging is considerably higher than the marginal cost that they incur. So this is another reason why monopolist is less efficient than perfect competition. Because in a perfect competition, the price is equal to marginal cost, and so there's no rent extracted. Whereas under the monopolist, the price they sell for their product is considerably higher than their marginal cost, which enables them to extract economic rent. Not really. 
Um, I would say that telecommunications behaves more like a monopoly. So I think if we think about telecommunications, we pay, uh, we pay markups because of the lack of, of market power, I'm sorry, the, the presence of market power in telecommunications. So I would say while telecommunications aren't monopoly in the sense that there are more than one firm, they behave like monopolists. And that's the problem with market concentration is that when market concentration gets high, even if you have more than one firm, all of those firms behave like monopolists, right? Again, like I said, when I moved into my apartment, I didn't get to choose what company, if I wanted cable, if I wanted internet, I had to go with Verizon. If Verizon knows that they have captured market like that, they don't have to charge, they don't have to charge a cheap price, right? What's, what's to prevent Verizon? Why would uh, Verizon charge a cheap price when they know that they have an entire apartment building, you know, a thousand people or more in an apartment building who, if those people want access to cable and television are gonna have to buy Verizon. So again, while it, you may look at telecommunications and say, well, there's more than one firm, the fact is, is that, that those firms still behave like monopolists. Yeah. The most important point here is this rent extraction. And as I mentioned before, rent extraction is lost consumer surplus specifically. So if we go back to the competitive outcome, we know that consumer surplus is this entire green triangle, right? This, this green triangle is our consumer surplus. And under perfect competition, consumers get the entire green triangle. Under the monopolist, however, because the price we pay is higher and because the product we get is less, then you'll see that the green triangle is much smaller, right? Some of this uh, green triangle is lost to deadweight loss, right? So notice we have deadweight loss under the monopolist. Again, deadweight loss is our measure of economic inefficiency. In addition, there is this green rect or sorry, blue rectangle. This also used to be consumer surplus, but now this is producer surplus. So this is what I mean by rent extraction. So normally producers in a market like this would only get this blue triangle. And again, there's a lot of there's a lot of producers in this market because it's a competitive market. And so there's a lot of producers all splitting this blue triangle. Under the monopolist, the uh, producer, the monopolist gets uh, an area which is, let's see, in this scenario is larger than under perfect competition. So under perfect competition, producer surplus is 125. Under the monopolist, we can see that producer surplus is 167. So not only does the monopolist get all of the producer surplus because there's only one firm, but in fact, producer surplus is now higher. And in particular, what we're concerned about is that part of this producer surplus used to be consumer surplus. And that's why we call it rent extraction. So this is not only economically efficient, um, but it's also bad. It's like sort of bad for the health of the market. Because what it means is that your consumers are paying higher prices and they're having their consumer surplus reduced beyond what would it would have been happened under a competitive equilibrium. So what this shows you is that under the competitive equilibrium, we have no dead weight loss and no rent extraction. Consumer surplus is 125. And then under the monopolist, consumer surplus is now only 55. Dead weight loss is now greater than zero. And we have $55 worth of rent extraction. So not only is this, this uh, economic system uh, not only is the, is the economics here inefficient, but consumers are worse off, right? So literally the market is less healthy than it was under the competitive equilibrium. One of the things to notice about the deadweight loss triangle, as I always like to point out, is the deadweight loss triangle is simply equal to the base times uh, one half base times height, the, the area of a triangle. Notice that the base of this triangle is simply equal to the discrepancy in the private market, um, the competitive market, uh, quantity outcome and the uh, monopolist quantity outcome. And then the height is the difference between the price and marginal cost. So remember the reason why monopolists are inefficient is because they use their market power to charge prices which are greater than marginal cost, okay? So the deadweight loss of a monopolist is gonna be a function of to what extent does the market see less product, which makes a lot of sense because this shows you the inefficiency and to what extent are consumers paying prices greater than marginal cost? If the efficiency of perfectly competitive markets 
is that we pay prices at or near marginal cost, then the inefficiency of non-competitive markets will be that we pay prices far away from marginal cost and we get less product. So in the monopolist, you get less bang for more buck, which is not how you want that sentence to go, right? You want more bang for less buck, but with a monopolist, you get less bang for more buck. So it's economically inefficient. So in other words, a free market will be economically inefficient in the presence of a monopoly. A free market would be economically efficient if it was competitive, which we can see that efficiency here because there's no deadweight loss. A monopolist is not efficient because of the presence of deadweight loss. And additionally, that inefficiency is wrought upon consumers. So consumers now pay higher prices than they would have otherwise. So not only is the market less efficient, but consumers are worse off. 